Two things that happened now that is just astounding. Number one, the bulk of the Muslims have fled to a foreign land. Number two, two of the most promising men of their town have converted. And so this caused them to really come together and think about what they would do. And it is said that in the seventh year of the da'wah, all of the Qurayshi tribes came together and discussed what needed to be done until they agreed we need to kill Muhammad. That's the one, only one thing on their mind is to kill, kill, kill. So for the final time, they went to Abu Talib. And they say to him that you do not have any choice in the matter. Either you will hand over Muhammad and we will give you whatever blood money and none of us is going to do the job. It's not going to be a Qurashi or we will have to cut you off from the Quraysh. How are you going to cut us off? We're blood relatives. None of us will allow you to get any food and water. We will boycott you. No marriages and no money and no business transactions. Any of us who owns a business, we're going to tell him that he cannot buy and sell anything for you. Food, water, drink, nothing. And when the Quraysh came to Abu Talib like this, Abu Talib himself became furious. And he said, do as you please. I'm not going to hand my nephew over to you. Abu Talib therefore decided that if we're not going to be able to buy and sell in Mecca, we're going to have any access to the shops of Mecca, then let us go and live elsewhere. And they moved to some of the valleys that the Banu Hashim owned and they were called the valleys of Abu Talib, Shabi Abi Talib. And so Abu Talib then left to live in that valley and every single person from the Banu Hashim and the Banu Muttalib, they voluntarily went into what is called the famous boycott. And in order to solidify this, the Quraysh came together and wrote a pact amongst themselves. What is the treaty? Nobody will buy and sell to the Banu Hashim. Nobody will marry into or from the Banu Hashim. Nobody will basically socialize with the Banu Hashim. So it is a boycott of an economic, a political, a social level. And they wrote a treaty and they hung it inside the Kaaba. And of course, nobody entered the Kaaba. So they locked the door and it was inside the Kaaba. It is said that Bu'aid ibn Amr was the one who wrote this treaty. And the Prophet made dua against him and his hand became paralyzed until he died. And so for two or three years, they lived in this abandoned, basically, valley, eking out an existence, getting rainwater, uh, eating from the shrubbery and the leaves. Bilal says that we began defecating like goats defecate. Droppings. Our droppings couldn't be told different from the goats. And one of their main sources of food was that every few weeks, somebody felt sympathy for them and would send in some secret supplies into the valley. Otherwise, they eked out an existence. It is said that when they tried to go to the city, even when foreigners came, because foreigners are not under the boycott. During Hajj season, they're coming with supplies. Sometimes they try to sneak in some food. Sometimes they were successful. Other times, if they were caught or the people saw them, Abu Jahl would come and say, do not sell to these people. I will pay you double whatever they're offering you. Even during these two, three years, Years, the Prophet continued to give da'wah during the Hajj season. He would go out of the valley and he would meet with the tribes during the Hajj season and continue to try to find converts to the faith. When did and how did the boycott stop? As we said, the boycott probably lasted two or three years and a number of incidents were happened that brought about its conclusion. The first of these is that the Prophet made a dua against them and said, Oh Allah, send upon them a famine like the famine of Yusuf. That bad. And so the famine became so bad for the people of Mecca that they were forced to eat carcasses and to chew on dead animal skin. They had nothing else left after that time and they realized this was because of the dua of the Prophet wasallam and they sent some messengers to try to bring about some uh, reconciliation. The second incident is that some of the people of Quraysh whose hearts were softer, we already said this, they decided that they should do something to break the pact. And so the main one here was Hisham ibn Amr. Hisham ibn Amr felt that he needed to do something. So he called his friend Zuhair ibn Abi Umayma and they said, what can we do to bring about an end to this boycott? So they said, first thing we need to do is to bring about all of the people who are sympathetic, get them together. So they thought, who can they invite? And they invited uh, Mutam ibn Adi, number one on their list. Mutam ibn Adi, let's bring him in. Abu al-Bukhtari ibn Hisham, other people, three, four, five people whom they knew did not like the boycott. And then they said, what can we do? What plan can we do? So Zuhayr said, I have a plan. The next day, they went to the Kaaba and they all seated where they usually sit. Everyone goes to his place in this corner, that corner, that corner. So Zuhayr stood up and he said, for how long are we going to starve our own kith and kin to death? Abu Jahl became furious. Who do you think you are? We all agreed to this treaty. So when he said this, Hisham stood up. No, I didn't agree. You agreed. This is your idea. What do you mean it's my idea? We all, we had a meeting here. Mut'i 
Adam stood up. No, we didn't. This was something you forced on us, right? I didn't force it on you. We all agreed. Then the fourth one, Abu Bukhturi stood up, right? So one by one, every single person planted strategically around the Nadi is basically publicly challenging Abu Jahl. And so Abu Jahl realized something is wrong. People are just standing up one after the other. And he said, Wallahi, this is a plan that all of you have hatched. But of course, they didn't confess to this. And it seemed as if the public support had now shifted away. And then the final thing happened that, of course, completely turned the tide. One day, the Prophet ﷺ went to Abu Talib in the Sha'b, in the valley. And he said that, Oh, my uncle, Allah has informed me that the treaty that they wrote has been eaten up by termites or ants. Except for the phrase, Bismik Allahum. Just in the name of Allah. The whole treaty has... Now, the Kaaba is locked up. Nobody goes in. Of course, it is in a sealed pouch. You know, they have a parchment. They seal it up. It's in a cloth and everything. Abu Talib said, Your Lord has told you this? He said, Yes, he has told me this. Abu Talib said, I will stake my whole case on this. He said, yes, stake it on this. So Abu Talib then for the first time since the enactment of the treaty, marched back with a group of basically non-Muslims of the Banu Hashim. And he said, oh my people, let's forget about everything. Let's just bring out this treaty and let's see if we can reach a negotiation and deal. So they became happy that maybe you're going to agree to hand over the process. So they took out the treaty from the, it's still in the capsule or still in the, uh, the cloth, right? And they put it here. Now, Abu Talib said, my nephew has informed me that his Lord has told him that the treaty is no longer in existence. Everything has been eaten except Bismik Allahum. So my challenge to you is, Abu Talib stakes it all on his Iman in the Prophet I'm telling the truth. My challenge to you is, if that is the case, then let us be and we'll return to Mecca and we'll ignore the whole incident basically. And if it's not, then I'll hand over him to you instantaneously. Do with him as you please. So they said, well, of course. I mean, it seems obvious to them. Why would that possibly harm them? And so they opened up the bag, they opened up the cloth and lo and behold, there was no treaty except for the phrase Bismik Allahum. And they were furiated. They said this is of the sihr or magic that he's done, but they couldn't do anything because the promise had been given. And therefore, this allowed them to return back to Mecca. And this was what caused the treaty uh, to be uh, annulled. Uh, we learned that the Prophet and, and the Sahaba, they returned back to Mecca probably around the 10th year of the da'wah when the Prophet was around 49 years old. They finally returned to Mecca around two and a half to three years before the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.